morning and happy Sabbath. It's good to see each and every one of you this fine, cold Sabbath morning. It's good to see that the snow did not hold you back this morning and that I'm worshiping in the presence of the remnant of the remnant. Uh, so yes, the small remnant has come and not let the snow uh, deter them from coming to church. I'd like to welcome each and every one of you to the Worthington Seventh-day Adventist Church. My name is Pastor Jeremy. I have the privilege of serving here as a youth pastor. And we have a few announcements that we want to bring to your attention this morning. Uh, the first announcement that I have is on January the 11th. That's a Thursday, January the 11th, from 12 to 6, there's going to be a health expo at the Worthington Mall, and they are, uh, are in need of volunteers to help perform health screenings. So if you are interested, again, that is Thursday, January the 11th, from 12 to 6. If you're interested in helping uh, the health ministries do the health screenings at the Worthington Mall, please contact uh, Marge Hay, um, and she would be happy uh, to add you to the team. Again, that is January the 11th. Uh, my second uh, announcement is the Women's Wednesday AM Bible Study is continuing or starting up again or resuming on Wednesday, January the 10th in the Garden Room. And they're going to be studying uh, the, bo uh, the book Esther by Beth Moore. Uh, again, all women are invited. Again, that is January the 10th on Wednesday morning. That's when the Women's AM Bible Study uh, continues on. The Wednesday PM Women's Bible Study, hosted by Rose Hofracker and Megan Parks, will not start until Wednesday, February the 7th. And uh, in your bulletin, there are more information about the book that they will be studying. But again, that Bible study that happens on Wednesday evening will not continue on until February the 7th at Rose Hofracker's uh, residence. Um, my last announcement this morning, and there are many more announcements I can go over, but we just don't have time to do so. My last announcement this morning is on January the 13th. That is two weeks from this upcoming Sabbath. If you have a child that is part of our children's Sabbath school division, so that means cradle roll, which is zero, all the way to youth, which is 18. So if you have a child or a grandchild in the ages of 0 to 18, which is our cradle roll to our youth department on January the 13th at 6 p.m. here in the Church Fellowship Hall, we are going to have our first uh, Sabbath school and parent dinner. Now the purpose of this dinner is, number one, to get to know each other, because uh, there are times that parents and Sabbath school teachers do not know each other, and they don't know what they're uh, being taught in Sabbath school, so to get to know each other. And the second reason that we're having this meeting is so parents and Sabbath school teachers and the youth and children's ministry department of this church can resource and talk together on how we can best equip our children and youth to uh, be closer uh, to Jesus and to uh, fall in love more with Jesus. So again, that is January the 13th, starting at 6 p.m. That's 6 to 7.30 in the fellowship hall. There'll be dinner and conversation. So if you have a child in our Sabbath school department, you do not want to miss this event, January the 13th, um, in the fellowship hall. Well, that is all the announcements for today. Again, I said there are many more announcements. Uh, please open your bulletin and please read and make sure that you are informed on what is happening here at the Worthington Seventh-day Adventist Church. Again, it's good to see you, and have a happy Sabbath. Good morning. Happy New Year. Stand with me. Hymn 506, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Sing with me, please. A mighty fortress is our God, a, a bulwark never failing. Our helper he amid the flood, a mortal ill prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek 
to work us war, his craft and power might, and earth cruel aid. On earth is not his equal. Second stanza. Did we in our strength confide? Our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing? Thus as who that may be, Christ Jesus, it is He, Lord Sabaoth, His name, from age to age the same, and He must win the battle. Third stanza. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath will the prince of darkness be. We tremble not for him, but rage we can endure, for lo, this doom is sure. Oh, is One little world should fail. Them last sounds and really bring it out. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are through him who with us Let goods and earth go, the mortal man also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, his kingdom is forever. Thank you. Be seated. Happy Sabbath. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to those watching as well on TV. I wanted to lend my welcome to those uh, that are here and those that are watching. Um, my name is Dan, and I'm happy to uh, lead us through prayer this morning and through our offering. So if you would, if you're here with me, as you are able, please uh, kneel with me for prayer. Father in heaven, to this Sabbath our hearts are full, Lord. We are full. They are full because this is the end of another year, Lord, and because we are so grateful for all the gifts you've given us. Lord, our health, our safety, and our families. There's so much going on all around us, Lord, and we know that those even within our congregation have not been shielded completely from all the hate and all the death and all the sin and all of the sickness that permeates this world, Lord. But we have a faith that you will lead us through, and in the end, you will make all things right. So until that day, Lord, give us faith and give us hope. Give us hope into the new year, hope that the winter snows will eventually melt, and the leaves will turn and spring will come, just 
to remind us, Lord, that just in the same way that you constructed nature to remind us of you, we too will get to see that glorious day when you will come to take us home. For those who are not here today, Lord, those that are watching at home or in a hospital room or at, in their homes uh, watching our service this morning, we want you to know, we want them to know that we are thinking of them and we love them and they are part of our family. Thank you for all those who consider themselves to be part of our uh, family here of the Worthington Seventh-day Adventist Church. Lord, I pray for our church leaders. I pray specifically for Jeremy and for Yolian this year, Lord. I pray that you would anoint their minds and their hearts to lead us in the direction you would have us go. I pray for our board members, our elders, our deacons, and past, our, our uh, Sabbath school leaders, Lord, the teachers at our school and daycare. I pray that you would take all of those that come to this campus every day to lead children and families to you, and I pray that you would touch their hearts. And in this year, Lord, that you would take us farther than we ever have gone before in spreading your word and your love to those around us. Please, Lord, forgive us for when we, we fall short of the mark. We know that none of us under our, own, um, under our own standing can stand before judgment, Lord. We only pray that you and your son, that your son's grace would over, uh, overtake us and he would stand in place of us, that on that day we can be welcomed into your kingdom. And until that day comes, keep us working for you. And thank you for our family here in Worthington. And thank you for this church. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. You may be seated. I know that we are a smaller group today than usual, but I, uh, I'm grateful to see everyone who is here today. Uh, we do have an offering. Uh, this it will be our last offering of the 2017 calendar year, and it's an important offering because this is the last offering that we have before um, the end of the year. Um, as you know, one of the things that we do at the end of the year is that we take the funds that we set aside for our Christmas club, and we use those funds to help. Um, uh, oversee any, any, um, any, any um, issues in our budget that have fallen short of where we need them to be, we use these monies to help make up that difference at the end of the year. So please, I would ask that each of you consider um, being able to contribute this last Sabbath to our, our uh, Christmas fund and to the local church budget. The local church budget is what pays for our choir and the heat in this building and the lights and the sound and all the programs we do for the kids and the health ministry. All the things that our church does locally is funded through our local church budget. So I would ask at the end of the year, um, and I looked this morning, I didn't know how much I had when I came in. I think I have $18 uh, left from the week, and I'm going to take what I have, those $18, and I'm going to put them in an envelope, but I got off the tree out front, and I'm going to mark my envelope um, for the Christmas tree fund, for the Christmas fund. And although I know it's, it's not a, a large contribution, I know that it's, um, it's one piece of a whole that will together make up the budget and again, the Lord will take us through this year successfully. Um, so please, yeah, yes, sir. So for those of you at home who can't hear because there was no mic there, uh, Brother Bob uh, Bradley just informed me that there was a special offering given by a particular uh, donor, anonymous donor, who has made uh, a, a large contribution toward that, uh, toward that goal. And I would ask that each of you, each of us, look in ourselves and see if we can't also contribute in some small way to uh, meeting the finances of our church. Um, at, that, at this time, let's bow our heads for a quick word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the Sabbath day. Thank you so much for this church and for the ministries of the Ohio Conference and our, our world church as well, Lord. But this, this Sabbath, at the end of 2017, Lord, I pray that you would open the floodgates financially for our church, and that you would provide the resources through our offerings and giving that would uh, allow us to meet the, the, uh, the ambitious goals that you have set forward for us, Lord. Father, I, I often, and I know many of us, fall into a trap in this kind of church, Lord, where we look back at the, glory, the, the history of this church and we see so much that's been done with the hospital, the food company, and all the ministries throughout the decades here on this campus, Lord. And we think that the best days are behind us at this church. But Lord, I, I know and I believe truly and fully that your plan for this church is not over and that there are bigger and, and more ambitious dreams that you have for this congregation that we can possibly dream for ourselves. 
And I pray that you would lead us and lead our leaders toward those goals and ambitions, Lord. Help us to reach out and change the world for you in a very, and not in a small way, Lord, in a big way. I pray that you would bless these tithes and offerings and help them to meet that lofty goal. Help us to spread the word to as many as we can until you return and take us home. Amen. Uh, today we have a special um, offertory. Do you guys want to come on up? Are you guys uh, singing? And I'll have you guys introduce yourselves real quick, too. Is that okay? Do we have mics? Do you guys need mics, or are you going to use this mic? You need mics? Let's see. There's one right here. Can I get you another one? Do you need a mic? The white one? The white one? Here you go. Do you guys want to introduce yourselves real quick before you do your special music? And I'll get out of the way. Uh, hi, my name is Jessica Dederon. My name is TJ Sunimia Dederon. Sabbath, we are going to have a teeny tiny children's story today. So, if I can invite the children and those who feel like children to come on down to the front, please.
Good morning, boys and girls. We gotta get some more girls in this church, right? Did anybody have a good Christmas? Anyone? Okay, that's good. Um, next holiday that we're gonna celebrate is called what? What is it called? Yes, sir. New Year's, and of course we're going to celebrate the new year, right? Well, I'm glad you had a good Christmas, but today I'm going to tell you about the worst New Year's Eve I've ever had. Ah, oh, it was terrible. When I was growing up, boys and girls, I had all kinds of animals at my house, and the story I'm going to tell you about today involves a bunny. A bunny. You see, I had two bunnies. Their names were Muffy and Buffy, and... It was an interesting story how we got Muffy. One day, one of our friends just kind of brought her over. I had a boy bunny, and Muffy was a girl bunny, and they said, wouldn't it be fun if we put them together? And they put them together before my dad even came home. So I had baby bunnies, and that was really fun, and they were really cute, but there were several of them, and one of those bunnies was not feeling so well. And this happened on New Year's Eve. Well, this bunny was not feeling so well on New Year's Eve, but we had a party to go to, and so my parents said, let's go to the party, and maybe when we come back, the bunny will feel better. Wink, wink. So we went to the party, and when we came back, the bunny was even worse. See, what they had happened was that the bunny was going to fall asleep eternally while we were gone, but that didn't happen. The bunny was still there. And so when we came home, I, I went down the stairs immediately, and I checked on my bunny. I said, my bunny is still here, and he is feeling very, very sick now. I better hold him because it was getting close to midnight. So I put him in a very soft blanket and I pet his soft fur and, and my mom tried to read us a book so that she could distract us from what was happening. And right around midnight, all of a sudden, I started to cry because guess what happened, boys and girls? The bunny died. Worst New Year's Ever. Everybody else around the, the country was celebrating and they were drinking bubbly juice and kissing each other and having a great time. But at midnight, one little girl, me, was crying because my bunny had died right in my arms. Well, that was a hard one to come back from. It took me quite some time. But you know what, boys and girls? The good news is that's the worst New Year's Eve I've ever had. So hopefully it can only get better from here. You know, there's going to be not just a new year, but a new age when Jesus comes again. And we'll be drinking more than just bubbly, sparkly juice late at night. We'll be drinking some fresh grape juice that Jesus is waiting to drink until we get together with him again. And we won't be wearing ridiculous hats or silly glasses. We'll be wearing sparkling golden crowns and maybe even some wings. But best of all, in my opinion, boys and girls, we're going to be with Jesus. And if we're with Jesus, that means no bunny and nobody is going to die ever again. Boys and girls, I hope you enjoy the new year that is coming, but I know we're all going to enjoy that new age that's coming when Jesus comes again. Let's pray about that and ask Jesus to come soon right now. Dear Jesus, we cannot wait till you come. There are so many great things that are going to happen. We just ask that you would help us to be patient until that time. In Jesus' name, we all said together, amen. Okay, boys and girls, we're going to collect the offering today by using our hands. So look for those dollar bills and coins that might be around waving at us in the audience. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for braving the weather and coming here and joining us uh, for our worship service. Those of you who are sitting upstairs and you decide to come downstairs, you're more than welcome. We're going to feel a little bit bigger, the crowd. My name is Pastor Julian, and I have the privilege to serve as a lead pastor of Worthington Seventh Adventist Church. And today, I'm not going to be preaching because I'm still on vacation. But I'm so glad to introduce to you one of our elders, Ricky Lavon. Uh, he's uh, also leading our men's uh, Bible study group, and he's author of several books. So if you have not checked out yet his uh, men's Bible study class, which meets on Thursdays, was it uh, 645. Yeah, 6, 645 to 8. So please check it out. He's doing a really amazingly good job. And uh, so with no further ado, I would like to, to invite uh, Ricky to join me here. I'm going to pray together with him, and he'll have the pulpit. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the privilege to listen to your divine word. I would like to ask you to bless Elder Lavon as he is presenting uh, your word to us. Bless our congregation and those who are watching us online. And let your word does not come empty. Let your divine word touch our hearts, transform us, and change us forever and ever. Thank you for listening to our prayer, and we pray for the blessing upon our Elder Lavon in the name of Jesus. And all the people of God said together, Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Pastor. Praise the Lord, everybody. I don't know if you could tell in my voice right now, but I have a slight cold going on. Um, but I said, but Lord, I know with you, you can, we can definitely make it through. We already did once. Before we get started, I always like to pray, but thank you, Pastor, so much for this wonderful opportunity and for everyone who is here um, this particular Sabbath for breaking, for being able to come through the snow and the winter and everything else. For all those who are at home watching, thank you so much for being a part. Dear Lord, now please remove your servant and you take over and be in control. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This particular subject um, stems from actually Passover which is of course the service that for us usually takes place during March or April. So when coming across this, I thought it would be a little interesting to be able to do it now during actually Christmas and during December, but the Lord said just keep pushing through and you'll see how this all plays a part. Now Passover, and it says celebrate Passover, Festival of Freedom. I believe that's the Red Sea even, and these are all the people who's going through, was an institution that was set up because the Lord looked down on his people and he realized and recognized that for 400 years his people had been enslaved and bondage and it was time for them to be able to get to the place to that promised land to where he had promised or he had ordained or what he said he was going to take them the interesting thing about it is that the Passover was basically instituted right before the last of the ten plagues and I thought it was interesting because the Lord didn't set this up after or before or during any of the other plagues because he knew that although you had flies and blood and frogs and everything else he knew that freedom for his people was not about to come but when it was he set up a foundation a mindset so that way they could be prepared to go to the new place. And in Exodus chapter 12, verse 1 through 14, is the institution of this Passover. This thing in which you would take an unblemished animal, a sheep or goat, and unleavened bread, bitter herbs, put blood on the doorposts, um, so that way the death angel then would go over. And the Lord set up all this because he wanted to set their minds in a different way. And I love it because that's how God is with us. We have six points that we're going to get through. This is actually just a little bit more of a bonus thing, but God does the exact same thing. Sometimes we go through different things in our lives. 
Sometimes there are situations that are keeping us bondage, that's keeping us held, whether it's sin or circumstances. And the Lord is like, I'm setting up different things in your life to prepare you. And just like the Israelites, they looked at all the different plagues and they assumed that maybe now it would be the time that they would be free or maybe this time when God called them, when they called a certain plague or when Moses would go into um, Pharaoh, maybe it was this time that was our time. It would not come until the 10th plague. Some of us, before we are able to get to where God wants us, might be early in this stage. Others of us might actually be towards the end. But whenever it is, the Lord will set up something for you because he doesn't want you to have the same mindset that's keeping you in bondage as the exact same mindset going forward. Amen. The next thing the Lord did was also have a reason, a process of unleavened bread. And that's found in Exodus chapter 12, verse 15 and 20. And we'll go over a little bit of that later. But well, the first point that we really can talk about is that when we have this new year, to start remembering the good things that God has done for you. And I was telling in first service, I said something that you could do is to literally write down something. Put it somewhere. But at least one thing of which you can honestly say, you know what, God, you did this for me. You helped me overcome something. I was bondage or enslaved to a particular thing, an item, a person. But now, leaving 2017, going to 2018, I'm free of that. Write it down and remember it. So when next year, at the end, you can say, Lord, look, this is where you have brought me from, from 2017 to 2018. Then write out something else that's saying, Lord, look what you have done for me now. Look how much growth. So you can say to the Lord, no matter the year that you might have, you can always say, truly, we do serve a mighty good God. Now, the thing about Passover is that it was a holy time. It was a time in which when the Lord set it up, it was meant to be the start. Just like us, when we started off in January and the month, even in its name, comes from the Roman god Janus, which has a double face. I wish I could have had a picture up there. I didn't think about it. But Janus literally has a face that's on the front and the back of his head, which means he's always looking back on 2017, but look forward to whatever God is going to do for us. So it was for them remembering how God brought them over, looking back, but also how God can do something for them in the future. So during this high holy time, a group of people came together in a plot to kill Jesus. And then in Luke chapter 22, verse 1 through 6, and this story is throughout the Gospels in general told in a variety of different ways. I believe this is supposed to be Judas right here in the yellow, and these are the priests. And what happened is that the priests were gathered together in a plot in an effort to figure out how can we get rid of Jesus. Because they were noticing that this person was bringing in throngs of people. And even in um, John chapter 11, in the earlier part, Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead. And here it talks about how the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what shall we do for this man, talking about Jesus, works many signs. If we let him, talking about Jesus, alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. And their whole mindset was simple. Here comes this man, this carpenter from Galilee, speaking and doing great things and gathering all these people I am a priest who have been through school who have been through education who have did all the training for you longer than this man has even been alive on earth and now he thinks he's going to come in and take my power my position after all the things that I have done 
The thing we have to remember is that the people who were plotting to kill Jesus was basically one of his own. It didn't say that a group of Romans was trying to do it, a group of people who believed in Zeus or Athena, atheists, agnostics, um, heretics, whatever. Not them. It was the priest in Christ's own church who, because he was a threat to their power, not because he was being blasphemous or speaking wrong, not because he wasn't speaking something that was in the word of God or the, at that time the Torah, not because of his ministry, but because they will take our place and our nation. Sometimes we get caught up on things of this earth. And that's point number two. Do not let earthly things and goals kill God's plan for you. Just a few things. This is, I don't know if you can see that, it's like a car that has been bedazzled with diamonds. So don't take loud things. It's really hard. I should have made it bigger, but it's literally a car that they took diamonds and put it in the paint and sprayed it on. And it's all glittery. But in other words, don't let things... Don't let power, this is a king over pawns. Don't let money or wealth, don't even let family or self or the world lead you away to kill the plan that God has for you. Sometimes we get caught up in the things that we see. Well, as long as I'm able to do this thing here, Go to this job, go to this person, meet these people or get this amount of wealth, do whatever it takes. As long as I have that, then everything will be okay. But in reality, the Lord is like, I want you to think greater. There's a bigger thing out there. There's a larger mindset. The Lord is like, I want you to try to strive for eternity. All this stuff is just here. It's just things even family and people is great, it's fantastic. But you can't allow them sometimes to pull you away from the dreams or the, the, the mindset that God has for each and every one of us. Now the priests at this time, they recognized that they could not walk up and snatch Jesus. The crowds would have went ballistic, of course, because if you're someone who's lame or you know someone who was sick, and you know that this guy, Jesus, just healed you. And now you can actually see because of this guy named Jesus. And someone tries to take him away. Oh, no, no, no. You, you can't take my resource. You can't take my health, my, my, my connection that I now have with God away. People would have went insane. So they were like, we have to find a way to get in and get the Lord. Now walks in that weak link, better known as Judas. For oftentimes, the country's um, powers and empires do not actually fall apart because of outside influences trying to take them down. Often, they are broken down because of something that happens on the inside. And point number three is, do not be the weak link in a ministry that God has called for you to work. Let me say that again. Do not be the weak link in the ministry that God has called for you to work. Right here, and it's a little bit tough, is a screenshot from the movie 300. These are Spartan soldiers. It's kind of tough. To, these are their helmets and shields and spears. And these are more of them back there. It's, it's a movie that's more fantastical and fantasy-like but it's based off of a real story where Persia, on their conquest of conquering, well, the world, they want to go up to Greece and be able to do the same thing. Well, to be able to do that, there was this little narrow area. It would be as though you had a large body, a large army, and you want to go straight down this middle aisle. Now, the Spartans was having none of it. They was like, we will not be subjugated to no one. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you have a 1,000 or 10,000 soldiers. It does not matter. So the Spartans laid camp at one end of this pass, and the Persian army was at the other end. 
with the Persian army figure, like, it's okay. We got more soldiers. We're just going to bust our way straight through. Well, the Spartans was tough, knew how to fight in close quarters, was just taking on this group one after the other. It didn't matter if they had fiery weapons, spears, large elephants. It didn't matter. Whatever they came, the Spartans went in there and took them down. The only way that they were able to actually be beaten was that one of their own, who due to a physical ailment could not fight side by side with them, was angry at the job that he was given, was ticked off, went to the Persians and told them, if you would take this other little goat path that's on the side of where this army is sitting, you would be able to surround them and take them down. Sure enough, in the movie that happens, and this one person became a weak link to all these men who ended up dying. The thing that we have to remember that no matter if you're at church, around the city, in the country, on your job, or even at school, God has a purpose for every single person here. It doesn't matter if you're young, if you're mature, male, female, does not matter. God has a purpose, but sometimes our purpose is to help another person's ministry. Sometimes our purpose is there to be able to support someone else. And we may or may not like all the times of what that person is doing, but at least do what you can to be able to do what God has called you to do instead of saying, I want to do it my way. Therefore, what I'm going to do is sabotage the success of this other person's ministry, making them look bad so then I can come in and do a much better job. That sounds terrible, sounds horrible and awful, but believe you me, it happens even in church. But we cannot have that mindset. We cannot have the exact same mindset, the exact same um, ideas that Judas have in saying, I need to do it a certain way so I might have to sabotage or become that weak link. After all this has been said and done and Passover, of course, is about to get started. Jesus is with his disciples and he says what you see right there behind me. From John chapter 13, verse 21 and 26. While everyone is gathered together, they have their food, the unleavened bread, the drink. The disciple, Jesus makes this announcement in verse 21. When Jesus had said this. He was troubled in his spirit and testified, I assure you, one of you will betray me. Now, I've always wondered, I can only imagine how the disciples must have felt. They're trying to relive maybe the times of what God did for Moses and for the children of Israel, sending them through the, the, um, the Red Sea. Or maybe they're trying to figure out who would be the best, best and the greatest in the kingdom or doing all this other stuff. Their mindset is on any and everything else. And all of a sudden, to the exact same room and those who have been with the Lord through um, storms, through looking at demoniacs and looking at blind people being healed. And they literally saw a person just be raised from the dead. And they're all right there together. And Jesus says, I'm looking at the closest people right here to me. And one of you will betray me. Peter, of course, most boisterous of the group, is, of course, curious, talks with John. is like, well, we got to find out. I mean, I don't think it'll be me. I don't, I'll never betray the Lord. I can't, who, which one of us? Who could it be? Jesus finally says in verse 26, he's the one I give the piece of bread to after I have dipped it. And we had dipped the bread. He gave it to Judas, Simon, Simon Issachar's son. Now this is how John puts it. Some of the other gospels put it a little bit differently, but I love that version only because I can only imagine if I was Judas, knowing that I had just talked to the priest about to betray the Lord. I'm there with all the disciples. Hey, Peter, what's up, man? Yeah, how you guys doing? Oh, Matthew, hey, what's up? Oh, yeah, how's your mom doing? She doing? Okay, good, good. I'm glad to see you. Jesus makes this announcement. One of you are going to betray me. If I was Jesus, I would have been like, oh, 
Ooh, let me look at some of the architecture. Oh, this man's house is amazing. Look at the detail. There's no way I would have even gotten close to Jesus for him to even hand me the bread. And then when he actually handed me, or we were close enough for that to be able to happen, I just probably would be like, oh, no, Lord, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. No, I'm not hungry. No, that's all right. That's, you know what? I'm, I'll eat a little bit later. I ate earlier. Praise the Lord. Praise you. Praise you. Amen. Praise you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I don't, I don't need to have anything to eat. I can only imagine what's going through his mind. And the interesting thing about that is that Jesus used the bread. And this is what actually got me, to, and we did this for the men's Bible study, the lesson in general, is that Jesus used the unleavened bread. Now, unleavened bread is basically bread that doesn't have any uh, yeast, baking soda, other agents that will cause the bread to rise, the dough to rise. That's how we normally eat bread is rise. As you can tell, this is more like the communion wafers that we have, tortillas, other flatbreads tend to have this. They don't have anything that's um, making the bread to rise. And the reason why is because in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 through 8, um, talks about a little bit, just one of the verses that talks about what it means as far as unleavened bread. It is not to say that yeast or any of this other stuff is sinful, it's not that. It's just as an example, just like as yeast can get into bread and it raises up everything, and a little bit can do it, so can sin in someone's heart also raise you up to be able to do crazy things, to be wicked. Paul even says in verse 8, so let's celebrate the feast with the unleavened bread of honesty and truth, not with old yeast or with the yeast of evil and wickedness. So basically he's saying, you know, it's all about this purity, honesty. That's what the unleavened bread means. Yet, for some reason, the Lord was like, I'm going to use this. And this even talks about being holy, having that character of the Lord and Leviticus being holy. And Peter responding to Leviticus saying, we need to be holy. So our next point, point number four, is taking on the character of Jesus. Taking on that character that says, I want to be like him. I want to be holy. I want to be pure. I want to be um, the loving Savior that we see. I tell people all the time, I say, if you want to know more about Jesus, literally start at Matthew 2018. Start at Matthew chapter 1 and see how Jesus interacted with people. How did he perform miracles? What did he say to people? That kind of stuff. But even still, with this particular piece of bread, Jesus uses it as a means not so much at this one point that would have meant something that would have been super good or great, but instead it was this I don't want to say symbol, but it was this means of the one who takes on this. This particular bread at this one time is a person who's going to betray me. This is an example of a, of a person who sometimes wants to be a CEO of a company. They get the, the ability or the lifetime chance and they're talking it over with God. And they're saying, Lord, I've been working hard in this company. And I know because I've taken the classes and I've met with the right people and I've done the right things. I can run this company and I can do great things with it. I could become the CEO, COO or CEO of this particular business, this brand. Have high dreams and want to do it. And the Lord tells them, it's not for you. At least not right now. But God, I can do great things. I could be able to use my position and power to influence pos positive change at this company and so much more. I have to become the CEO. And the Lord is like, it's not for you, but I'll open a door for you to go. But it's not for you. If you do this, you will betray me. So the person goes and does exactly that. And when the job opens up and they become CEO, and they're like, yes, I knew it. See, I knew God was on my back. That's why he opened up that door. But then the hours spent at work 
takes a toll on his body. He starts turning to other substances to be able to hang in there or start meeting people who start leading him down a path that he shouldn't. And he start, doesn't see his or her family that much as they used to. And all of a sudden now he might be getting a divorce or barely seeing their children or so many other things. And they're not coming to church and they're not having that relationship with God. And he turns around and he says, what happened, Lord? You allowed me to be able to go down this path. And Jesus says, I know I allowed you, but I was warning you, if you go down this path, if you take that job, it will lead you to your downfall. Jesus basically tells Judas, I know what you're going to do, but if you go down that path, it will lead to your downfall. In John chapter 13, verse 26 and 27, we already know about 26 when Jesus talks about the one I give the piece of food to. But then Judas ate the piece of bread. Satan entered him. Therefore, Jesus told him what you're doing, do quickly. Jesus knew at that moment when he took the piece of bread, okay, you're going to do what you're going to do. Then at least go. Our next point to remember is beware of the Judas mindset. Now, that's not a mindset of pure evil all the time. Even though in the Bible, oftentimes, whenever Judas is mentioned, whenever he's listed with the other 12 disciples, it's always Peter and James and John and their dads or their distinction of who they are. But Judas is always last. Son of Issachar, the traitor. Judas, the traitor. Judas, the traitor. Now, of course, that was written after all this had came about. Because at the time, even in John, John even admits that when Jesus told him to go and do what you need to do, they just assumed that he was going to give money to the poor or pay for the stuff for the, for the Passover. That's what they thought. Judas was the one who even said when Mary came to be able to wash Jesus' feet, well, that money could have been given to the poor or this could have happened. That kind of fake charity type of stuff that he was doing but still enough to them Judas seemed to be the one that was okay the Judas mindset though is one where you believe you have an idea and that idea is correct even if it's in the face of God let me explain in the Desire of Ages, Ellen White's Desire of Ages, chapter 76, is all about Judas. It's an excellent chapter. You can actually read the entire thing online if you desire. Or you pick up the book, whichever is comfortable for you. She makes several different points about Judas and the things that his mindset, what he was doing, and everything else that was going on. But there was two things that I thought was really interesting. Number one, notwithstanding the Savior's own teaching, Judas was continually advancing the idea that Christ would reign as king in Jerusalem. It was he who set on foot the project to take Christ by force and make him king. His hopes were high. His disappointments were bitter. From Judah's standpoint, he was living in Israel, who was under the oppression of the Romans. They had some type of duality purpose basically the Romans was running over them and what he saw in Jesus was the ability for the Jews or for him to be in power imagine if you would Jesus is on earth now of course we see movies with our TV shows with superpower beings and this kind of stuff but Jesus out there people who you know are blind can now see people who couldn't walk are now walking uh, people who had leprosy are now clean, and that would just be the health stuff. So you would say, like, wow, that's pretty cool. Then you also, though, experience when there was a storm, and apparently Christ, what we would call was a waterbender, was able to walk out on the water during a storm. He was able to be like what we would say one of the X-Men characters, literally named Storm, control the storm with his voice. Then not that long ago, you just saw him raise someone from the dead. This person is amazing. To Judas, you are, able, you are now in the presence of a being 
that it doesn't matter how many forces the Roman army send your way. If everyone in Israel fought, all Jesus would have to do is just wave his hand and all his people could come back to life and keep on fighting. He probably said, this is what I'm talking about. And by me, as Judas, the top person amongst the disciples, I will be Christ or this king's right hand man. That was his mindset. He wasn't paying attention to when the Lord was talking about how he was going to have to die in three days and how he was looking for this salvation of the world and how he was trying to save. It wasn't paying it. Oh, saving people. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. You can literally do whatever you want. Literally. Are you kidding me? No. He was all about that power. He saw something in, in Jesus and said, if we can do this way, that would be amazing. He even forced it. Ellen White talks about how Judas did not, however, believe that Christ would permit himself, this is when he was being arrested, to be arrested, and betraying him. It was his purpose to teach him a lesson. Say that again. It was his purpose to teach Jesus Christ a lesson. Since he had escaped so many snares, thought Judas, he certainly would not allow himself to be taken. This is an amazing thing, and this is something that we have to be careful of as well. Do we seek out to teach God a lesson? Do we sometimes look and say, Lord, this is how it has to be done. I can see the work that you would want to do in me to these people. So give me the power, the money, the finances, the health, the whatever it is, and I know I can go out there and do all these things for you. And the Lord is like, that's great, but that's not what I've called you to do. Doesn't matter, God. Give me that talent, that power, that money. Get, come on, Lord, you got to be able to do it. And then when it doesn't happen, you're like, well, I don't understand. So I'm going to teach God a lesson. I'm going to force his hand into showing to be able to bless me to help me to get that person to do something else lord i'm going to teach you a lesson sometimes we get confused there's god's way and i love how it's like one arrow and then my way which is like multiple because in reality that's what it's all about us in the church have to be so so careful why are we doing the things that we're doing why do we pray why do we teach why do we preach why do we come to church but also very importantly why do we do the ministries help bless talk to believe why do we do any of this are we doing it just because of our own self do we accidentally sometimes have a judas mindset and believe that whatever i say goes then that's how it has to be. Because Judas, when it talks about Satan entered to him, he didn't go out there and immediately try to like um, get drunk, get on drugs, go to a whorehouse, do nothing crazy like that. When Satan entered him, he just went out, found the priest, and betrayed Christ. And the thing about it is for us sometimes that we look at people who might be out there doing all these physical wrongs or whatever. But in our mind, do we sometimes have that Judas mindset and that when it comes to doing stuff for the Lord, we prefer it our way compared to God's way. Now there's one last point I just want to say before we close out, is that to remember Jesus in 2018, to encourage each and every person here to remember the Lord. That it doesn't matter whatever it is that we might do to not fall under the Judas mindset and the mindset of, well, I believe that this is what I've been called to do or I'm going to do it this way. But the mindset that says, Lord, I'm just going to go on the route that you take me. Knowing that one day, one day soon, just as the Israelites as you led them out of bondage and over into the promised land, 
on earth, dear God, there's a part for me that you want me to be. There's a place. There's a mindset. There's something that you want me to also accomplish. And I know that I can get there, but I have to get there on your terms by doing it your way, man. So regardless if we're participating in communion, remember Jesus. When you're coming to church, remember Jesus. On your job, remember Jesus. At school, remember Jesus. When you are amongst your family members, the people out there on the street, whether they're just on, literally on the street or in the grocery store, remember Jesus. When the Lord calls a ministry in your life, remember Jesus. Whatever it is that you might want to do, accomplish, say, look, or experience, remember, remember, remember Jesus. So that way in 2018, you can say that that, that year was a fantastic year. Not because the amount of people that you might have been able to baptize or the amount of people that um, you might have been able to talk with or the amount of items or things or money or health. 2018 was a fantastic year because each and every day, every day, at least once, you always remember to do something in remembrance to Jesus. Thank you. Be blessed and be safe from going home. stand and sing together hymn 142 angels we have heard on high <clears throat> let's sing it out together angels we have heard on high Swinging sweetly through the night And the mountains in reply Echoing their brave delight Gloria in excelsis Deo This side only, the second stanza. Come on. Shepherds, why this jubilee? Why these songs of... What great brightness did you see? What glad tidings did you hear? All Gloria in excelsis Deo Gloria in excelsis Deo this side, third stanza. Come to Bethlehem and see Him whose birth the angels sing. Come adore on bended knee Christ the Lord, the newborn King of glory. Excelsis Deo Gloria In 
an excelsis Deo. All together on the last stanza. See him in a manger laid, whom the angels praise above. Mary, Joseph, lend your aid while we raise our heart in love. Sing it out. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for allowing us to be able to be here on this wonderful day, for allowing us to be able to brave out the snow and whatnot, just to be able to experience your presence right here in your home. Now, dear Lord, please allow us to be able to take any of the information that has been um, spread through rather from Sabbath school to even church service, allow it to be able to apply it to our hearts, but also be able to apply it um, to those that we might come across in this upcoming year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.